Cadwell. Ladies and gentlemen, sorting through some family papers, we came upon a parcel of three old-fashioned uh, school exercise books. They were labelled The White Journals, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3, respectively. They contained 24 copies of letters and three original ones written by the Reverend Cyril Herbert R. White and his wife Mary White between May 1878 and July 1881. All but the first were written from the rectory St. Peter's Church East London and were addressed generally to dear friends. Arranged in chronological order, uh, these present a really very vivid account of the daily life of Mr. and Mrs. C. H. E. Weich during the three and a half years of his incumbency as the rector of uh, St. Peter's on the West Bank. Although these letters are concerned predominantly with uh, church occasions and parochial concerns, uh, such as bazaars, festival services, and the birth pangs of St. John's Church in Panmure, then a suburb of West Bank, the letters contain numerous references to con the contemporary scene and delightful vignettes of East London and of East Londoners of the 70s. Personal reactions to many interesting events are vividly recorded. For example, the opening of the Grahamstown Port Elizabeth railway line and nearer home, the completion of the East London Queenstown line. Also, many shipwrecks and the frequent alarms and excursions of the various native wars which form the background of the period. The Hope War in the Transkei the Lafleur Revolt in East Griqualand, the Zulu War, the Basutu War, the Gaika Graleka War, and so they go on. The Whites' comments reveal that East London was more closely involved in these disturbances than is commonly realised today. Uh, these will be mentioned later. Now, to introduce the authors. Uh, Cyril Herbert R. Weich came from what I consider one of the most interesting families in England in all time. The family tree, well, it resembles one of those redwood, Californian redwoods. The roots, uh, they weren't set in the Garden of Eden because they were set in a peat bog at Droitwich in England, pretty well at the time when the uh, Garden of Eden was flourishing in the Middle East. The name Wach actually means peat bog in uh, Anglo-Saxon. At some distance up the, track, uh, up the trunk of that tree, well beyond the roots, occurs the name of Edward the Confessor. And some centuries later, one of the truly nicest saints of the church contributed by the uh, by England. A really delightful character named Sir Richard de Wach, Bishop of Chichester. And to balance the saints in the Wach genealogy, there are, of course, the sinners, outstanding among whom was an 18th century Sir Peter Wach, a great property owner in London at that time, who lost Regent Street at the card tables at White's one night. 
arts and science. They are also very well represented in the family tree. There was another Sir Peter White, not the same one. He was one of the founders of the Royal Society and shared with James I and Isaac Newton the honour of being one of the foundation fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, Sir Evelyn White, while Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, invited his ailing friend, Handel, to come and convalesce at the Royal Lodge in Dublin, and thus it came about that the first British audience to hear Handel's recently com uh, completed oratorio, The Messiah, was a Dublin audience. And so it goes on. But the really significant fact about the White's genealogy, from the point of view, from our point of view, is the fact that it is one of those typically English service families, in their case, the service of the church. From generation to generation, um, the um, members of the family joined the priesthood in a very long succession, long before the Reformation and since the Reformation. As a matter of fact, when I find my sons being rather irksome, I remind them that they are the descendants of a long line of celibates. It's not a very wise thing to say because it brings my wife into the <laughs> picture and that leaves me in the minority. <laughs> now, this service family had built up a very long tradition of, of uh, service which had become almost hereditary and had for itself the highest ideals and, in my opinion, these ancient English families which have from generation to generation followed high ideals of service, they are, in my opinion, the finest products of Christian Western civilization. Now, in addition to all these inherited excellencies, and to his inherited sense of service and high ideals, uh, Cyril Herbert R. White was really a very brilliant scholar. And he was the rector of a St. Peter's Church in Eaton Square in London. A word about his wife, Mary White. She was a moxon. The Moxons were at the time a uh, family of perhaps more social consequence than the Watches. Uh, she came from a family with its high traditions of service as well. One might say that she was the counterpart, really, of um, her husband, and she was wholly dedicated to good works, to the forwarding of her husband's spiritual work, and to the care of her lively young family of five children. Among her ancestors, the most interesting was John Evelyn, the diarist, a contemporary of Pepys, and almost as famous as a diarist as Samuel Pepys himself. Now, most of the letters written by Cyril and Mary White, they are written by Mary White, with her vigorous style and cast of thought. And uh, usually Cyril White added a postscript to her letters. All these letters were addressed to a family friend in London, a Miss Duckenfield, though actually headed Dear Friends. Apparently by agreement, Miss Duckenfield copied the originals into these more durable exercise books 
for circulation among the Wyatt's London friends. Now, suddenly, and after the manner of dedicated men, Cyril Herbert R. Wyatt, at the age of 40, a man obviously marked out for early and rapid promotion, he inexplicably threw up everything, all his bright prospects, to become rector of another St. Peter's, this time on the West Bank of the Buffalo River Mouth. The family embarked at Deptford in early May 1878 on the um, Dublin Castle, the mayorship Dublin Castle. The party included their five young children, two servants. This vessel was a very small one. It was one of these semi beside the captain and the table conversation usually led by Mr. Patterson, MLA for Port Elizabeth, was about the unpleasantness of East London and descriptions of the many horrors awaiting the watchers on landing at Buffalo Mouth. The voyage had long assumed the nature of a living nightmare before the Dublin Castle docked in Table Bay on the 26th of May, 1878. The three days spent in Cape Town made a very strong impression upon the watchers. First and foremost was a variety of races and colours, both as to pigmentation and also dress. As you know, the Malays in Cape Town are very fond of vivid colours, coloured clothes. Next impression was that created by the handsome cabs with the conical hatted Malay drivers and in natural sequel the execrable roads in Cape Town. Mrs. White gives a five mile cab a description of a five mile cab journey from the harbour to Papendorp, as Woodstock was known in those days, and this reads like a modern Jeep journey across the DB flats. Most of their time in Cape Town was spent on a round of inspection of charitable institutions, receiving financial aid from London friends. One social call was made at Government House on the Friars, who were old London friends of Mrs. White. Now on the 29th of June, the White party transshipped to a coaster uh, called the Elizabeth Martin to complete the voyage to uh, Buffalo Mouth. They ran directly into the most violent storm. When they arrived at the Cowie, it was impossible for lighters to venture across the bar. Consequently, the Elizabeth Martin bucketed and wallowed um, at anchor off Port Alfred for 48 hours. Waves broke abroad, aboard, flooding the companionways and public rooms. It was so bad uh, that it was necessary to lock the children in the cabins for the sake of safety. At last, anchor was dropped in Buffalo River at Roadstead on Monday the 5th of June, 1878. Next morning early, the lifeboat, manned by 16 oarsmen, came alongside with the port captain and the postmaster, who was a church warden of St. Peter's, no doubt using undue influence. Orders were to disembark the White family only, but with a little persuasion, a Baptist minister and his family were allowed to escape also. The basket process of transshipment was quite the worst experience of the whole voyage that Mrs. White could recall later. Shortly after they had landed, a gale arose and the balance of the unfortunate passengers on board of the Elizabeth Martin stayed put for another four days. Now, as the St. Peter's Rectory was not habitable, owing to extensive repairs which, were, uh, which had not yet been completed, the watches were very liberally distributed over the length and breadth 
of the West Bank. One incident in housing them temporarily had a happy ending. A major problem had been posed by finding accommodation for Miss Whites. They hadn't realized that the Whites were bringing out a Miss White. This had been taken very seriously and no successful solution was discovered until it was found that Miss White was a baby in arms and the mother was quite prepared to share her bedroom with her baby. <laughs> One night of separation from their children was as much as the Whites could take. They determined to move into the rectory, uninhabitable or not, and they did so immediately. Anyone familiar with the present St. Peter's Rectory will very easily recognise it from Mrs. White's description, more especially with the completion of the two extra bedrooms which were then in process of construction. The building has altered surprisingly little since 18. Uh, 78. The kitchen, still the same building, then had a mud floor and no stove. It was a hearthstone for a stove. The Whites sadly missed their household furniture, which they had very unwisely shipped on a sailing vessel, the Koh-i-Noor, which took 15 months on the voyage, which is really well worth description. It had put out into the channel when its leaking state necessitated a very rapid run back to harbour owing to leaks. The next attempt to start was thwarted by a full-blooded mutiny of the sailors who refused to go to sea to risk their lives for the sake of the koh -Nor. Eventually it did set sail and was driven into a South American port in a sinking condition. An expenditure of 2,000 pounds made it seaworthy once more. But when the Whites eventually unpacked their household gods, it was only to find that practically everything perishable had done so, had been ruined by seawater, and a great amount of the rest, amount of the rest had been stolen and the case is, of course, beautifully closed up again. To fill the cup to overflowing, there followed an account based upon an admiralty court ruling for Mr. White to pay his pro rata share of the £2,000 account for ship repairs affected in Rio. All consignees of cargo on the koh -Nor were expected to pay the account of £2,000 in full among them. Meanwhile, the watchers had to lay in new furniture or go very uncomfortable. A description of the church follows in the letter. An interesting fact for those who are interested in St. Peter's, the mother Anglican church of East London, is that this, the present building, according to Mr. and Mrs. Watch, was never referred to as the church. It was referred to as the temporary church, and they called it the school building. A school was held in this, uh, classes were held in this particular building. The board of control, the people who owned the school, the, well, the, their little company had gone bankrupt uh, just before the watchers arrived. And so when Mr. White arrived, he was presented with the school as a going concern. He was to take over. And out of the goodness of his heart, he did. <coughs> there was not the slightest doubt that had the Whites remained any length of time at West Bank, there would have been an entirely different church building standing where St. Peter's stands today. Now, any plan of immediate demolition of the so-called school building was temporarily thwarted by the comparatively heavy debt incurred through the improvements and the repairs to an enlargement of the rectory 
in the first place, and in the second place, to the wretched situation which had arisen across the river in Panmure, where the faltering start to the construction of St. John's Church had come to a rather unsavoury halt. St. John's definitely had to be given priority. Under misguided leadership, the Anglicans had collected some 600 pounds. As there was no qualified architect in East London in those days, some, undivi uh, some individual who had a piece of paper, a pencil and a ruler, he committed to paper his concept of what the New Jerusalem should be like, and some rascal of a builder was set to work on constructing the St. John's on the plan drawn up by this amateur. When the 600 pounds had been spent, this individual, the builder, apparently disappeared. And when at last a suitable architect's plan had been obtained, most of the construction work had first to be demolished at a price before the task could begin practically day over. This was a state of affairs when the watchers arrived and seriously considered, this is interesting, the watchers seriously considered removing all the window panes from the uh, school building to send them across to St. John's because they were very short of glass. As a matter of fact, St. John's Church, after it was completed, it had oil, oiled uh, canvas windows. The windows were covered for a very long time before glass could be obtained for them. From the housewife's point of view, the daily round in East London was very much the same as it used to be until comparatively recently. For example, here Mrs. White's on the subject of East London's water supply. It is a great trouble here, she said, the scarcity of water. The wells are fast drying up again, and we have no rain. No one who has not tried it can realize what this want is. Whether I want to have a room cleaned, or to bath the children, or cook the dinner, or wash clothes, one has to stint every operation for the sake of saving a pail of water. And until we can buy an iron tank, we cannot drink any out of our own tubs till it has been boiled. No doubt largely as a result of the shortage of good water, enteric, according to Mrs. White, was endemic among young children in East London during the 70s. And at present, the account continues, there is no medical assistance one can rely on in East London. I must be ill indeed, or the children either, before we called in the Dutchman, who is called here a doctor. <laughs> Yet another commentary upon East London's water problem in the 70s is contained in the list of donors whose generosity had made possible the outstandingly successful conversazione held in Panmure, I suspect in the Mutual Hall, in aid of St. John's Church funds. <coughs> An enterprising Panmurian, who at the time was doing a roaring trade in retailing fresh water to households by the bucketful, was heartily thanked for the generous donation of two buckets of water which greatly eased the responsibility of the women who had to make the tea and the coffee for the conversazione. <laughs> the watchers rapidly settled down to a full exacting life impinging upon community life at so many points that their influence at the, uh, from the centre pervaded every corner of the West Bank and the East London East, a name which Mr. White records was rapidly replacing that of Panmure. To give some idea of how full the Whites' lives had become, here is a list of routine services conducted by Mr. White 